The year is 2024, and the latest fantasy horror film Damsel has made a shocking debut. While many legendary tales depict heroic tales of rescuing damsels, this movie is entirely different. The princess must rely on her own courage and wit to defeat a fire-breathing dragon. Centuries ago, humans established the kingdom of Aurea on a continent. However, they soon discovered that other inhabitants had lived there long before humans arrived. Of its kind, now only this one remained. The monster was savage and bloodthirsty, leaving its lair to attack villages. The king summoned soldiers to enter the monster's lair and avenge his people, but their steel weapons were no match for the beast. The soldiers were incinerated by the monster's flames one by one. Before long, only the king remained alive. He watched the massive silhouette approach from the darkness, dropped his weapon, and knelt, awaiting death's arrival. Time flew by, and centuries later, the remote and barren northern kingdom welcomed guests from afar. They brought a marriage proposal from Queen Isabel of the Kingdom of Aurea, hoping that Princess Elodie would travel there to become the wife of her son. Prince Henry, Elodie's father and Lady Bayford were delighted by this news, and the marriage proposal came with much gold and goods as dowry. Seeing that Elodie was reluctant to marry a complete stranger, Lord Bayford told her that their granaries would not last until the snow melted, and their people needed this to survive it was the duty of royalty. And so the family embarked on a voyage across the sea to the beautiful kingdom of Aurea, whose splendor and abundance made it seem like a dream. From the balcony of her guest quarters in the palace, Elodie spotted another beautiful young woman across the way in a tower room, who was promptly ushered away by her handmaidens when Elodie's curiosity was piqued. That night, returning to the balcony, Elodie witnessed a plume of fire erupting from the towering, cloud-piercing mountains behind the palace. The next day, she met Queen Isabel of Aurea and Prince Henry, Isabel took Lord Bayford aside to discuss some wedding matters, giving the young couple a chance to converse privately. Elodie expressed that this union would save her people, and her personal happiness was a small price for her people's future. However, Lord Bayford and Isabel seemed disheartened after their discussion. Lady Bayford promptly asked if they had failed to agree on a price. Bayford shook his head, saying the gold Isabel offered was unimaginable, but was unwilling to elaborate on the rest. So Lady Bayford took it upon herself to curry favor with Isabel as they would soon be family. But Isabel subtly pointed out Lady Bayford's lowly origins, stating this marriage was merely a transaction of interests their family wanted wealth, and the Orion royals needed a bride. Though unaware of what was being exchanged, and despite her stepson's dislike for her, Lady Bayford still approached Elodie about terminating this marriage, feeling the royals could not be trusted just for being royals. At that moment, Lord Bayford appeared and told Lady Bayford to leave. I hope you know what you're doing. The next day, Elodie and Henry's wedding proceeded as planned. Afterwards, Prince Henry led Elodie by carriage into the mountains, saying it was a tradition for newlywed royals to pay respects to their ancestors. Midway up the mountain, Elodie found Isabel and others wearing gold masks awaiting their arrival. Isabel explained that for generations, the royal duty had been to protect their people, at great cost but great reward. After the ancestors founded Aurea, they discovered a powerful monster that would leave its lair to attack villages. The king summoned soldiers to the monster's lair to avenge his people, but they were annihilated. The monster did not kill the king, but forced him into a cruel choice. Surrender three beloved daughters to the beast, and it would share the island with humans. Loving his daughters dearly yet duty-bound to his subjects, the king struck this bargain, and the three princesses were ultimately devoured by the beast. The kingdom of Aurea was then born, and every generation since has commemorated this sacrifice a tradition tracing back centuries. Isabel used a small knife to cut open the palms of Elodie and Henry's hands. You now inherit Princess Elodie of Aurea. Let our two lines mingle and fast become one. She is now of royal blood. After her explanation, Isabel instructed Elodie to toss a gold coin into the ravine. The ritual concluded with the prince carrying Elodie back down the mountain, but just as Elodie shyly buried her head in her husband's chest, Henry apologized and abruptly flung her into the deep ravine. Vines lining the ravine saved Elodie's life, and when she awoke, she realized she had become a sacrificial offering to the royals. Elodie sought an escape route, but the sheer cliffs were unscalable. She discovered a cave entrance and ventured inside, surprisingly finding a glowing light source. Inside the cave was a huge cavernous space, 
and the glowing thing turned out to be a small bird with its feathers on fire. Kind-hearted Elodie immediately smothered the bird's flames with sand, perplexed by the poor creature's plight. But within seconds, countless flaming birds erupted from the cave, screeching as they burned to death around her. At that moment, a massive beast appeared before Elodie, terrifying her into flight. The monster followed close behind. It actually spoke in human language, asking her name and saying her people for generations must repay their debts. Elodie was baffled, as her family should have no connection to the monster, but it stated the royal blood coursing through her veins had given away her identity. Elodie then realized the blood mingling from her and the prince's cut palms was merely to infuse her with royal blood and deceive the beast. After narrowly evading the dragon's fiery breath, Elodie spotted a charred corpse the same young woman she had seen from her balcony the previous day. Hearing the dragon's voice closing in, Elodie frantically fled deeper into the cave, but her dress's frame became wedged in a crevice. As the dragon unleashed another torrent of flames, Elodie dodged the fire, but her leg was severely burned. The dragon mocked that she couldn't escape and praised her for being more entertaining than the previous girl, who had died too easily. Elodie tore cloth from her dress to crudely bandage her leg wound. Using the lingering flames, she lit a small lamp and ventured further into the caves to flee. But she accidentally fell through a crevice into an area with an eerie blue glow. Separated by a bottomless chasm, Elodie looked at the wedding ring on her hand and remembered the lies Henry had told her. She threw the ring into the abyss and leaped with all her might to the other side. With the help of her dagger, Elodie finally reached the opposite side. Elodie discovered that the glowing liquid came from a slug-like creature, so she took a few of the glowing slugs and wrapped them in her skirt to use as illumination for the path. Soon she saw a pool ahead of her, but she just took a sip of water and spat it out. Realizing the pool was fed by melting ice stalactites above, Elodie positioned herself to catch the dripping water in her mouth. But the ice rapidly melted, and the dragon burst through, appearing before Elodie. Luckily, her agility allowed her to scramble into a cramped crevice as the dragon patiently remarked that though she had found a hiding spot like the others, her fate would not change. After it departed, Elodie discovered several female corpses in the crevice, their names etched into the cave walls. That night, she dreamed of the girls who had suffered the same gruesome demise. The next day, Elodie climbed to a cliffside and spotted figures approaching in the distance. She frantically called out for help. What's this? It turned out that Lord Bayford still couldn't stop worrying about his daughter. He hired a local guide at a high price to lead the way and find her. Now that the guide had brought Lord Bayford to the nest, his mission was complete and he was about to leave. Besides, the chances of his daughter surviving were probably slim. The next second, Lord Bayford's two guards tragically fell victim to the giant dragon's claws. Elodie watched helplessly as her father died a tragic death under the claws of the evil dragon, with his dying breath. He begged Elodie for forgiveness. Lord Bayford thought that sacrificing Elodie could secure the survival of his subjects and give him peace of mind, but he simply couldn't go through with it. Lady Bayford and her sister Floria were already waiting for her on the boat. Now that the guide had lured the giant dragon to another part of the cave, Elodie climbed up the rope her father and the others had descended on. Soon there were screams from the cave from the guide. The giant dragon discovered Elodie's attempt to escape and immediately spread its wings, flying over and breathing out a golden blaze towards her. <laughs> Elodie climbed up the cliff and narrowly evaded the giant dragon's breath once again. She rode her father's horse and charged towards the seaside. But how could a horse's speed compare to a giant dragon's? Just as the dragon was about to catch up, Elodie dismounted and hid. The steed was swiftly incinerated by the pursuing beast. Unable to find Elodie, the giant dragon incessantly unleashed its fury, setting the entire mountaintop ablaze. Seeing this scene, Isabel understood it was Elodie's doing. She ordered the soldiers to seize Elodie's sister Floria. Lady Bayford was stabbed when she tried to stop it. 
The next day, Elodie emerged from her hiding place and found the giant dragon had flown away. She hadn't even had time to rejoice before hearing the bad news Lady Bayford brought. Isabel had taken her sister Floria to replace her as a sacrificial offering to the giant dragon, by the time Elodie arrived at the previous ritual site. Floria had already been thrown off the cliff. She followed the rope and once again entered the giant dragon's lair. The giant dragon also planned to use Floria to lure Elodie out. Elodie used the guard's armor to create an hourglass mechanism. She successfully lured the giant dragon away with the noise. But Floria had injured her leg in the fall from the cliff and couldn't walk. The tricked dragon quickly flew back. Elodie, holding her father's sword, appeared behind the giant dragon and frankly stated that she and the dragon had both been deceived by the Orea royal family. They said the giant dragon had attacked the village. And the king came here only to protect his subjects. But the giant dragon said it had done nothing back then. It was the king who came and killed its three daughters. Its daughters were the last bloodline of the dragon race. So until its dying breath, it would also take away their daughters. Elodie explained that she wasn't of the Orea royal bloodline, but the giant dragon believed she was lying. Elodie, her body covered in burns, had just escaped from the pool when the giant dragon grabbed her. You will know my daughter's pain. With that said, the giant dragon's claw extended its nails and pierced into Elodie's abdomen, but Elodie drew her dagger and stabbed the dragon's eye, bursting it, seeing the giant dragon staring at her with its remaining eye. Elodie picked up the long sword from the ground and charged at it. She crouched down and thrust into the giant dragon's chest. Elodie used the sword to wound the giant dragon's claw, but she was also flung away. Seeing the giant dragon quickly getting up again, Elodie noticed the dust raised by the dragon's wings was reflecting off a concave rock. Elodie immediately had a flash of inspiration and thought of a plan. She walked over to that rock and started taunting, telling the giant dragon to burn her to death. The rebounding blaze scorched half of the giant dragon's body, heavily wounded. It finally fell down, unable to move. Elodie approached the giant dragon. Instead of killing it, she showed the dragon the scar on her palm. This was the Orea royal family's method of making her a member of the royal family. All these years, every princess the giant dragon killed was fake. It had been slaughtering innocent daughters, just like the royal family had slaughtered young dragons back then. But Elodie stuck the sword in front of the giant dragon's eye. She no longer wanted to take orders from anyone. With that said, Elodie went to the pool and fished out some blue glowing slugs, placing them on the giant dragon's wounds in her own. The burns on her leg before had been healed by these magical slugs. A few days later, during another wedding ceremony in the palace, a gold coin rolled to Isabel's feet. Elodie appeared before everyone, and scathed. I will offer you all one last chance to do the same. But aside from the new princess's family, not many people left. Hearing this, the giant dragon appeared above the castle and with one dragon flame, turned the Orea royal family and the entire castle into a sea of fire. As Elodie walked step by step out of the city, that giant dragon also soared behind her. A few months later, Lady Bayford and Floria established a new kingdom here. Elodie set sail and returned to her home in the north. From then on, people called Elodie the mother of dragons. Her story became the most beautiful legend in the kingdom.